the secret to sustainable productivity is to find a way to make the thing that we're trying to do a little bit more fun. When you're having fun, productivity takes care of itself and you don't need to worry about things like discipline and grit and willpower and motivation and all that stuff to, to coerce ourselves into doing the thing. The problem with that philosophy is that there are some things that are just boring. There are some things that are just not fun that we don't wanna do that we have to do anyway. But for those things, there is an answer. That answer is to make it fun by using an idea called gamification. Now the idea of gamification has been around for like a long time. It's sort of been co-opted by companies like Amazon and stuff using gamification to make their workers work more and more. But there is a way that we can use gamification to make our own lives more fun in terms of making the boring shit that we have to do more enjoyable so that we are more likely to do it because we know we have to do the thing anyway. And there's this really good book called Actionable Gamification by this chap, Yu Kai Chu Chow, who I would like to interview on my podcast at some point. He is a sort of human-centered design, creative consultant type person. So this is more like a textbook to help people designing things like video games, help them figure out, okay, what are the things that make video games interesting and how do we bring more of those into products and games and experiences that we're designing. But if you just read the first, like, I don't know, 10% of it, you actually get some pretty solid principles that you can apply to your life to make anything you're doing a little bit more fun. And that's what we're talking about in today's video. And really the core thesis here is that video games have managed to find a way to make boring stuff more fun. Like no one ever has to play a video game. People have to go to work, but they get home from the end of their hard day of work and they log onto some kind of video game and they play for hours and hours, often into the nighttime, often knowing that it's a bad thing to do. But there's something about video games that draws people in and makes them waste, spend, use enormous amounts of time and money on these video games. So the question is, what is it that drives motivation in video games? And this guy, Yukai, has come up with this thing called the Octalysis Framework, which is basically a list of eight core drivers that video games tap into. And if we understand what those core drivers are, we can sort of reverse engineer and incorporate those strategies into any boring stuff that we have to do to make it more fun. Okay, so the first drive is epic meaning and calling. Now, the idea here is that if the thing that you are doing, the thing that you're working on, the mission that you're on, the adventure that you're on, feels like it's part of some wider meaning or some wider purpose, that will just automatically make whatever the thing is you're doing more enjoyable and more motivating. You're a wizard, Harry. Now this is actually a very big question, like how do we find purpose in what we do? So I'm gonna come back to that and let's move on to number two. And number two is called development and accomplishment. Now in video game context, development and accomplishment is when we are leveling up and when we are getting things done, when we're completing quests, when we're leveling up in World of Warcraft and we get a little ding and we sort of post ding in our guild chat, people are like, oh my God, congrats, you've hit level 80. And there is something remarkably motivating about this idea of leveling up. And so the real life version of this is that if you are doing something which is boring and you have to do it anyway, one way to make it more fun is to try and incorporate this idea of accomplishment into the thing that you're doing. For example, authors, what they often do is they track their word count. They have a little progress bar at the top of their page and they're like, right, every day I need to bang out 2,000 words or 4,000 words. And then as they're typing stuff, they can literally see that little progress bar filling like a leveling up bar. And so if they ever need that extra motivation to do the thing, they just look at the word count and they think, okay, cool, I'm making progress, it's the progress bar. Another way you can apply this to your own life that I find really helpful is actually just making a to-do list and ticking things off. We've all had that feeling. It's incredibly satisfying to go on a to-do list, like type, write things out and then tick them off and cross them out, that taps into our core drive for development and accomplishment, and that makes anything boring a little bit more fun. The next core driver that we have is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So what's this like in video games? Let's take a video game like the Soul series, Elden Ring, for example, and people die repeatedly in those games. But as you're doing the thing, as you're repeatedly falling to Margit and dying 120 times, put these foolish ambitions to rest. You're figuring out ways that you can beat the boss. You're figuring out what the strategies are. You're sort of figuring out the timing of their attacks. You're using your creativity. And the way he defines creativity in the book, it's like finding multiple ways to solve the same problem. Ultimately, you're always trying to take down the boss, but you're trying to find different ways of going about it. And there's something about that, even if you're just dying repeatedly and repeatedly, night after night after night to that particular boss, there's something incredibly motivating about finding those extra solutions to the problem. And then the other way in which video games like really tap into this empowerment thing is by giving us immediate feedback. And so if we wanna apply this to our lives to make whatever boring stuff we have to do a little bit more fun, we wanna think about, okay, how can I be more creative with this? And how can I get quicker feedback? One of the real problems that causes procrastination and like leads to low motivation is the idea that generally the things we procrastinate from, the things we find boring and hard and we don't wanna do, but we have to do or we should do, are the things that have a long-term payoff 
that don't have an immediate term reward. And so that's why one strategy that you can use is to shorten the feedback loops. If, for example, you're a student and you're trying to study for an exam, but that exam is like a whole year away, it's really hard to motivate yourself to do the thing. Whereas if, for example, you could test yourself every week and treat it like a video game, treat it like a personal challenge, that's how I approach tests and exams. It's like a personal game that I'm playing with myself, where I'm sort of in kind of friendly competition with my friends, but like, we're not taking it too seriously. It's just a personal game. And that means whenever I'm testing myself, I'm getting that real-time feedback. I'm shortening the feedback loop. And then I get this sense of empowerment that as I'm doing the thing, I'm improving, which taps into our development and accomplishment core drive as well. But it's really all about shortening the feedback loop to make almost anything that's inherently boring and feel and, and a little bit long-termy, a little bit more fun. The fourth drive is called ownership and possession. And this taps into our fundamental need for autonomy, for ownership, for a sense of control over the things that we're doing. And again, this is something that really video game design designers take huge advantage of. I clocked in, for example, like 190 non-stop days worth of playtime on World of Warcraft because it was my character. I could upgrade my character, I could get my own gold, do my own jewel crafting and inscription and all that crap. But it's like video gamers will work so much, they'll put in so much time, money and effort into leveling up their own characters because they feel that sense of autonomy, that sense of ownership. So how do we apply this to our day-to-day -day lives to make whatever we're doing more fun? Well, I've kind of got three different things that I try and think about when I'm applying this to my life and that's ownership of the outcome, ownership of the process and ownership of the belief. All right, so ownership of the outcome. Generally, if you're having to do something, it's not boring, but you have to do it, you might not have ownership of the actual outcome. You might not be able to actually choose what you're doing. You just know you have to do it. But if you can choose what you're doing, one way of doing that is by, for example, taking a little bit more responsibility. It's one of those like weird counterintuitive things that like, if you're finding something boring, the wrong way to approach it is by putting less effort into it. The wrong way people approach boring stuff that they find hard and don't really want to do, but they have to do anyway, is by thinking, you know what, I'm just going to do the bare minimum. I'm going to coast and then I'll have time in the evenings to play video games. Instead, if you actually like weirdly, if you put a little bit more effort in, take a little bit more ownership, a little bit more initiative, a little bit more responsibility, usually the thing just becomes more fun by default because autonomy is one of the core drivers of intrinsic motivation. Dan Ping talks about this in the book Drive, really good book all about intrinsic motivation. This is a big topic in actionable gamification as well. Like ownership, autonomy, responsibility is a core driver of why we find things enjoyable. But even if you don't have ownership of the outcome, you can have ownership of the process. Usually, let's say you're at work or at school or whatever, and you're told what to do, you're not necessarily told how you have to do it. And so you can make the how your own. You can find a way, again, to exercise creativity, which speaks to core driver number three, creative expression, empowerment, feedback, that kind of thing. You can find a way to incorporate creativity and your own autonomy into the process behind the thing that you're doing. For example, if you're working as a junior doctor, you're kind of a bit of an admin monkey. You have to write these kind of summaries for patients and discharge summaries and stuff. It can get kind of boring, but if you make the process your own and if you, if you figure out a way to have fun with it, change up the fonts and do it in a nicer way and change up the formatting so it's a bit clearer. Those are all those little things that you can you can take ownership of and that makes this sometimes boring thing a lot more fun because you're taking ownership. And ultimately, even if you have no ownership of the outcome and you literally physically have no possibility of having ownership of the process, i.e. you're in the kind of job or thing where you're told what to do and how to do it to a lesser, you always have ownership over the mindset, the belief with which you're trying to do the thing. And the way I think about it is that sort of there's two ways of looking at the things that we have to do. We can think of it as have to, or we can think of it as get to. This is from a great blog post by Seth Godin that I read a few years ago that I keep on I keep on coming back to. Anytime I'm doing something and I feel like the thing is boring and I feel like, oh, I have to do this thing. I try and take a step back and go into my mind and think, you know what? No, I don't have to do this thing. I get to do this thing. I am blessed to be able to do this thing, to have the privilege to do this thing. Sometimes that's a bit of a stretch, but the more I tell myself this, the more my brain, you know, Hebb's law, axons that fire together, wire together, all this stuff, the more that we can tell ourselves a particular thought, the more likely that thought is to become a natural extension of who we are and a natural part of how our brain works. So for me now, you know, sometimes I think, oh, I have to film all these videos today. And I think, no, I get to film all these videos today. This is really fun. And there's something about that that really taps into this core drive that we have for ownership, autonomy, responsibility. And that is a big part of what makes stuff fun in real life. Core driver number five, which we can incorporate into whatever we're doing is called social influence and relatedness. Now, basically what this means is that we find things more fun if people in our social group are also doing the thing and we feel like we can do it as part of a group. Again, video games take advantage of this massively. A game like World of Warcraft, which is stupidly popular, or these big like Final Fantasy, MMORPGs. The idea is that you're doing it with friends, you're getting into a group, there's like a social element of the game. And so the way we can apply that in real life is we can find a way to bring our friends or bring people into the boring stuff that we're trying to make more fun. For example, with me back in the day when I was studying for medical school exams, instead of trying to do it on my own, I would just get some friends and we'd all go to the same library and we'd all be working on different subjects, but we'd all be doing the Pomodoro technique together where we all work for 25 minutes and we take a five minute break. Then we do another 25 minutes and five minute break and we repeat the process. And there was just something magical about the fact that we were doing it as a group 
that made this boring thing, potentially boring thing, i.e. studying for exams, a lot more fun purely by the addition of other people into the thing. If you can't work with people in real life, there are websites like Focusmate, where you can literally have a Zoom co-working accountability buddy. There's things like Writer's Hour, which is this completely free Zoom co-working session that the London Writer's Salon runs four times a day for different time zones. And the idea behind that is that you get on the same Zoom call with about 300 people and you're all doing some writing. You're working on your own thing, but you're doing it with other people and that just makes it way more fun. So those were the white hat, kind of the nice ways of gamification. The other three are the black hat ways of gamification. These are, you know, we can incorporate them into our lives to make our lives a little bit more like a game-like, but I wouldn't say it makes necessarily makes our lives more fun. So I'm just going to blitz through these. So core driver number six is scarcity. It's the feeling of wanting something that we don't have. And again, video games take advantage of this. There's this, oh, that, that, that piece of gear that you really want, but you can't have it until you do all this stuff. And so you spend ages and ages doing all this stuff just so you can get this thing, which has no intrinsic value, but which has value to you because of the scarcity. Then there's unpredictable predictability and curiosity, which is core driver number seven, which is the kind of the sense that we get from like, oh, I'm not sure what's going to happen next. This is the system that slot machines and gambling, like gambling places, what are they called? Casinos really exploit because the unpredictability of the reward is what really fires that dopamine release. And then the final core driver, core driver number eight is loss and avoidance. It's like we fight really hard to avoid losing something. And so often in video games, video games really exploit the sense of fear of missing out. Oh, I have to log in every day to complete my daily quest because if I don't, I will miss out on those points that I could have gotten and it's got a cap on it. And therefore it's like, you know, the loss and avoidance and our intrinsic desire to not lose the things that we have or not miss out on things keeps us logging into these video games time and time again. These final three, I mean, there's different ways of incorporating them into our life. One way that you can use if you really want to is for example, by putting money on the line. If you know you really want to do something, but you're not able to do it, you're finding yourself procrastinating. You could just give a significant amount of money to a friend and say, hey, I want you to keep this money and you only give it back to me once I've done the thing. That's a very easy way to, for example, fake motivate yourself into doing the thing that you wanna do because you're trying to avoid that sense of losing money. But again, I don't really like it. I don't think it's a particularly sustainable strategy. I prefer the first five kind of these more white hat strategies that we can apply to anything we're doing in life to make it a little bit more fun. Now, the thing I talked about, the core driver number one, this idea of grand meaning and vision purpose in life, that is the ultimate driver of what drives intrinsic motivation, a sense of purpose. But it can be genuinely quite hard to actually figure out what our own sense of purpose is. And genuinely, this is a really hard thing to figure out, but there are three techniques in particular that I've come across over the last few years that I found super helpful in actually trying to figure out what the hell do I actually wanna do with my life? What is this grand purpose or vision and stuff? And all of that is in this video over here. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend watching it. Thank you so much for watching and see you there. Bye-bye.